Dear friends, it's hardly believable that a year has already passed since the Commandante died. We were not expecting him to die for a long, long time. And in fact, to my uh, shame, when the paperback edition of Pirates of the Caribbean was coming out, we thought Fidel was going down. And we put a halo around his head on the cover of the book. And the Cuban ambassador uh, at the time said, this may be a bit premature. So I, <laughs> so I said, well, we all hope it is premature, but just in case the old man goes, we wanted to mark it uh, as it's a sign of respect. And of course, Fidel is not well, but he is still there playing an important role. In the texts he, he produces and the statements he gives, and instead we've lost the commandant in, in a tragic way. But we all used to say, including him, that the test of the Bolivarian Revolution in reality would come after he had gone. And this is the process that we are now going through and to which I will return. But I want to start with. <coughs> what Bolivarianism is, uh, how it has been portrayed, and how this term is now used universally to describe the radical regimes in South America. Many of us, myself included, I don't refer to Latin American experts and scholars, uh, like my friend Richard God, who of course knew much of this, but those of us who were not that familiar with South American history actually learned the history of South America and the liberation movement from Chavez's speeches. I mean, of course, I certainly knew who Bolivar was and what he did, but it wasn't till I was in uh, Caracas, either in 2002 or 2003 or four, I can't remember, sitting down to listen to a Chavez speech. And an hour was spent explaining who Simon Rodriguez was and what his achievements were. <coughs> Simon Rodriguez, who he? <laughs> and it emerged, as one read more and more about that period, that Simon Rodriguez was, in, a, in effect, Bolivar's teacher, largely responsible for politicizing him, his private tutor, hired by his family to educate him, and Rodriguez, very influenced by the French Revolution, and especially its Jacobin wing, provided a very special education to the young Bolivar. <coughs> because Bolivar was born fortuitously in the late 18th century, in between two revolutions. The American Revolution, which kicked out the British, and the French Revolution based on the philosophers of the uh, ideology, based on Enlightenment philosophy, which effectively did away with religion for some time, not too long, about 20 years. Uh, and then it came back in different ways, and which abolished the monarchy, ended many of the landed estates in France, and inaugurated a bourgeois order, a bourgeois order in the progressive sense of the word. And if you are born in this period and growing up in this period, then your outlook is formed by the environment in which you live and work and travel. And in those days, of course, communications being what they were, often you had to travel to know what was really going on in a country. In a way, it's still true today, given the media, that you have to go into the country itself, but you understand what I'm saying. Technically, it was impossible to find out. It was through books which took months to travel on ships in the form of pamphlets or little booklets which arrived and you learned what was going on in France, etc. And the young Bolivar's outlook was formed by these two revolutions. From the American Revolution, he learned that it was possible to expel an occupying imperial power. For the Americans, it had been Britain. And for Bolivar, much more serious, uh, because he was 
uh, confronted with a much more effective rule was that of the Spanish. So the struggle against Spanish imperialism on which he embarked came after he had journeyed through Europe and seen the radical currents at work and seen the armies of Napoleon destroying reaction in many, many parts of Europe, sometimes effectively, sometimes ineffectively, and then Napoleon's own capitulations. And this mood uh, took hold of him. He became quite obsessed with the French Revolution and what was going on there, studied it, traveled to Britain later, traveled to other parts of Europe, observed some of these events firsthand and then went back, and launched a movement, of course, together with others, uh, to liberate the entire continent, barring Brazil, which was a Portuguese colony and therefore not on their target list, unfortunately. Uh, but that is where the movement began, and that is the, 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 the movement which, which succeeded. And it had a huge impact on the world. And uh, as he didn't succeed, he succeeded in getting rid of the Spanish. He didn't succeed in unifying the Spanish-speaking section of the continent, which was his aim and his goal. So if we are asked what is the relevance of all this today, the relevance stares you in the face. The relevance of all this is that after the defeat of the Spanish, another empire came into being, uh, which with the Monroe Doctrine declared that it and it alone, no other colonial powers could control the backyard, South America. And the history of US interventions in Central America and different, uh, um, and, and uh, other countries is well known, too well known uh, to go into here. So that is one very clear analogy. And in fact, during his last years, Bolivar had predicted this in one of his letters, of which he wrote thousands, uh, saying that the danger now, after we are getting rid of the Spanish, lies in the north where I see already the birth of a new empire, which we might have to deal with. Very prescient and very accurate. And that empire, of course, modern 20th century South America did have to deal with. And that empire has been active in South America from the early years of the 20th century onwards, uh, right to this very day. So Bolivarianism in today's context means independence, national independence, sovereignty, anti-imperialist anti -imperialist unity and an attempt to unite the continent, the whole continent against the imperial enemy. So when Hugo Chavez started talking about Bolivar and Bolivarianism, he of course added to it the word socialism, which didn't exist, though the ideas were floating around in Bolivar's time some of them pre-socialist ideas, uh, but Hugo Chavez brought socialism and he would often talk about Bolivarianism or 21st century socialism. Now, the significance of this was the following, that this happened, began to happen in the late 90s, and it happened at a time when it appeared, not wrongly, that capitalism had conquered the world, scored a huge triumph in dismantling or subverting its own enemies. When I think back now, I think the cleverest thing the Americans did during the Cold War was to intervene in the Sino-Soviet dispute and try and back China. I mean, it was a case of divide and rule on a global scale. Not, not all of us saw it as such at that time, but it now appears very significant indeed. And they succeeded. 
in the fact that the Soviet Union collapsed, arming itself more and more and more, and the Chinese given massive concessions by the West in the early phases to get capitalism to take off, finally made use of those uh, advantages and their economy took off in a big way and is currently astonishing the world. But there's no talk of socialism there. So in this context emerged a set of new rules and new plans on how to govern the world which are called neoliberal which has become a catch-all phrase now to describe what has happened and fine, okay. But what it essentially denotes is an economy which is based on the market in the sense of bringing in the private, uh, the, the private sector into every domain of social life. And many who thought that education and health would be left alone were proved to be wrong. Nothing was sacrosanct, and they got away with it and they did it. This was in Europe. And by and large, of course, there were struggles, the last of which was the big minor strikes in the 80s in this country, general strikes in France and in Italy at key moments with the imposition of different forms of neoliberalism. But, they succeeded. Effectively, they succeeded without any real struggle, continuous struggle, by the labor movements and the trade union movements of Europe. That didn't happen. They were defeated or crushed or didn't attempt it or were co-opted as in Germany, the most important country in Europe. Until the eruption in Greece, uh, we have not seen any continuous struggle with a political movement attached to it. This is what made the turn in South America so important. That Europe was appeared crushed. China had gone capitalist. The Soviet Union was divided up into little fiefdoms run by oligarchs. Eastern Europe was in the same direction. Yesterday's party bureaucrats were today's millionaires or billionaires. And Yugoslavia had been divided and split up by a savage and brutal civil war in which the West played its part. So this was a situation effectively in Western and Eastern Europe. Asia. <coughs> Nothing much going on there, either. Very happy to embrace the new consensus that the free flow of turbocharged capitalism was the only...